Hello, everyone out there. How are you today? Great. Good. We're having a great day. I just know everyone is having a great day. So I am Dr. Yvette, Yvette McQueen, MD, emergency physician and travel doctor, a global physician on a mission to educate about health, travel wellness, and disease prevention. So this is the series, Physicians Around the World, and I have another fabulous physician that love to travel like me. <laughs> so today we have Dr. Mary Fleming. Hey, Dr. Mary. Thanks for having <laughs> me. You're welcome. So tell us uh, where you like to practice, and I know what that answer is. <laughs> Um, what type of doctor are you? So I'm an OBGYN. Um, and for the past five years, I have been calling myself a locum physician, right? Uh, something that we have in common. So I travel full time. Um, currently, I'm working clinically in Sayre, Pennsylvania, which is way north Pennsylvania, right on the New York border. Um, just a relatively new position for me, but I have worked all over kind of the the eastern seaboard from Maine to, to Maryland, but um, off to Montana and Oklahoma before as well. So um, I, I've, I've worked in quite a few places in the U.S. Great, great. Okay. So uh, I was interested, uh, two things was interesting to me. One, you're a locums doctor. So uh, most people out there know as an emergency physician, I'm locums with emergency, I don't have patient clientele. I go in the ER, work my shift and leave. But with OB, you're delivering babies. How does that work with your traveling from hospital to hospital? Um, you know, every place is, is kind of different and it depends on where I'm going and how long I'm going. So I, I've done very short assignments where I'm just in covering for a doctor who it might be a solo practitioner who just needs a vacation, right? He just needs a few days off. So I just come in and, and cover in any drop-ins, that type of thing. Um, I Sometimes I go in and cover a maternity leave. Um, that was how I made it to Maine. I started out just covering a, an eight-week maternity leave. Um, and so I just took over that particular doctor's panel of patients for the time period and general practice, clinic, cover labor and delivery, cover GYN emergencies in the ER. Um, they um, liked me and invited me back. And so actually started going back. I went back and forth there for um, almost four years. And so then I, it was it's still locums, but I went back and forth that people were very comfortable with me and, and knew me pretty well. Um, other places I go is more for staffing issues. So someone's left, retired, you know, quit, whatever. Um, and then I just go in to fill the gap uh, until they... They, they have someone usually hired and that's coming and I'm just there to kind of fill that that void. So um, I just kind of take whatever comes in off the off the off the street, uh, as they say. So fill in whatever gap it is. So, yeah, like I say, substitute doctor. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so sometimes okay. it's just labor and delivery, but sometimes it's everything. So it just depends. Right. OK. So I know you love to travel, um, you know, locums, of course, but you like to do other type of travel. You had an interesting experience where you were able to live and practice medicine somewhere else. Tell us about that. And so, you know, interestingly, one of the reasons I wanted to do locums is so that I had more control over my schedule so that I could have an international experience. So it was something that I always wanted to do um, ever since medical school when, you know, SNMA was doing medical missions and I couldn't go because I didn't have any money. And um, I was very sad to, to miss out on those experiences. And so I, I made a plan to build that into my my career. And so, you know, tra you know, practicing traditionally in a private practice or a community based practice or employee practice, whatever kind of practice it, it is, it would be hard to take six months off to say, I want to go work in another practice setting or in a different country. And so when I started doing locums, I knew I wanted to build that in in the next few, few years. And so um, that was that was one of my goals. And so. My, my plan was to at least go for three months. It ended up being six. Um, and so I was looking for organizations that were already established in a community so that I wasn't 
um, I wanted to feel safe and supported and useful. <laughs> and so I wanted to go a place that was already established. And so I, I was looking purposely for those type of organizations. And so I volunteered with an organization called CMMB. Um, and they had a few different practice settings uh, in different countries around the world. Kenya was the best fit for me in that they were looking for um, an OB specifically. Um, that the language barrier was less severe. It's, you know, so I could have went to Haiti, but I don't speak um, any of the languages that would have been useful <laughs> in Haiti. Um, so Kenya was a great fit. It was a country I'd never been to before. Um, I had been on the continent once before to South Africa, but very different from East Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and where I was, it was in Matomo, which was very, very rural. So about four to five hours um, from Nairobi, um, depending wow. on who drove. Um, <laughs> but the first, the first couple hours were on a paved, you know, normal road, if you will. Uh, the last couple hours were on a, a dirt road. Um, so very bumpy, very dusty. Um, the hospital was, it was actually very well equipped to be as rural as they were. Um, the, the clinical staff was phenomenal. I mean, they, they worked really well with the resources that they had. Um, everyone from the physicians to um, the custodial services were patient oriented. They wanted everybody to have the best serve, best experience that they, they could. And I really appreciated that. Everybody was mindful of the resources of the patients and, and tried to make sure that they, um, we were taking care of them, but also being respectful of uh, the resources that they had and what they had to go home to. So um, that was a little bit of a different um, experience than how we, that's, we generally approach, approach patients in the U.S. Um, but anyway, I'm really a little bit. Most, but most people that say when they work in more rural areas or in countries that don't have as many resources that we have, they rely more on their clinical skills. Do you feel that your clinical skills improved while you were there? It was definitely so. It, it was interesting. I would say yes, but also they just differed um, a lot. So one of the one of the things, so here uh, I'm used to managing labor and delivery process right from start to finish. Um, there, for the most part, the, the nurses were very equipped to, to handle normal deliveries. Um, so I didn't really have to do that. I only had to do problem deliveries, complicated deliveries, C-sections, that type of thing. Um, one of the things that I, I did a lot was actually ultrasounding. So I, you know, I do ultrasounds, you know, from time to time here. But for the most part, if you need ultrasound, you go to the ultrasonographer, right? Um, but because they didn't have an ultrasonographer in-house, that kind of became part of, they were like, oh, they have to do OB ultrasounds. So I spent a lot more time doing that than I would have thought I would have done early on. So I was doing dating ultrasounds, post-date ultrasounds, um, you know, even diagnosing some anomalies, which I was not usually accustomed to. So that that was a different skill set. You were um, like, oh, I remember reading that in a book and here it is. So that was different. The other thing that was different mm -hmm. is there wasn't, um, there's not a NICU or a PICU or they're, they're not always a pediatrician. So a lot of the obstetrician's job was also to take care of the newborns or the premature babies. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely that is what probably made me feel the most uncomfortable. So I was definitely emailing and messaging colleagues here, like, hey, I've, you know, I've got this baby, this is going on, and like, what do I do? Um, so that was a stretch for me as well, kind of trying to figure out what to do with these premature babies. And and it was hard because, you know, normally, again, we would transition them out, we would transport them to a high level of care, but that wasn't a reality for most of our patients. Um, right. Take yeah. care of them right then and there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one thing I have noticed uh, when I visit the hospitals in other countries, they aren't set up with amenities for the patient like we have here. So, I mean, what about how, how does the patients get their food and supplies and things like that? Yeah. So, you know, again, I, I felt like this was a very well-equipped hospital compared to some of the other stories that I, that I've heard. Um, 
for the most part, you know, because I've even heard some places where they, you had to provide your own bedding, you had to have somebody come and pay for your OR pack before you could go back for a scheduled procedure, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so for the most part, the patients were supplied everything that they needed as far as bedding, basic IV fluids, um, basic medications were all included. Okay. Um, if, you know, they they fed them three meals a day from the cafeteria, uh, you know, they weren't gourmet meals, but they were, you know, nice, adequate meals. I think that the difference and one of the things, the transitions they were going through in Kenya and the country as a whole is they were trying to incorporate a national insurance uh, policy. And so they were part of um, coming to the hospital at that point was seeing if you were available for this national coverage and getting you enrolled. Because as you can imagine, a lot of places people are still coming, even though we were very rural, people are still coming from an hour, two hours, three hours away, sometimes on foot, right? So it's a captive audience. And while you're there trying to make sure you get enrolled in the program. For people who weren't enrolled or weren't qualified and, and came in for usually labor, right? And delivery is an emergent process, it's not scheduled. So you come in, you've got to have this procedure, you got to have your baby. Um, but if you can't pay, then what do you do? So um, it was interesting. Sometimes I would be rounding and they'd be like, oh, you don't need to see her. And I was like, I thought I discharged her yesterday. And then it was like, I thought I discharged her last week. And then I was like, I thought I discharged her 10 days ago. So a lot of times if they couldn't pay, they would just stay until they, uh, so they were rooming in, uh, <laughs> if you will. So they weren't receiving medications or food, but they would stay in the hospital until they could cover their bill. So that wow. was the um, and a lot of times the way they covered their bill is that the, their communities would, they would send out a call to back home uh, and their communities would put out a call to the, to the local people and they would collect money, a little, whatever you could give a little bit for days at a time until wow. you covered that community member's bill and then they would go home. Wow. That is community love. Yeah. Wow. And then sometimes you go home on a motorbike after you had a baby. Okay. Carrying a little newborn on a motorbike <laughs> and no helmet. <laughs> no helmet, not generally, not generally. No oh, yes. I know trauma in some of those countries. I, <laughs> a little, that was a little unnerving, but okay. yeah, great. So, uh, I hear you're part of something we call Read Scholars. Mm -hmm. I know. So, you're a scholar. <laughs> Tell me about your program. <laughs> So Reed Scholars is, um, it, is at heart an alumni organization. So there's a fellowship called the, the Commonwealth Fund uh, Minority, I just messed it up, Commonwealth Fund <laughs> Fellowship and Minority Health Policy. It's housed at Harvard in Boston. Um, and that's one of three fellowship programs that feed into, that's the one that I did, but that feed into the Reed Scholars. The other two are the California Endowment Fellowship and Minority Health Policy and the Joseph L. Henry Fellowship and Minority Health Policy. We're all physicians and dentists. We all have an interest in, in health equity. So we completed the fellowship and then we have organized as alumni to continue that work collectively um, in the health equity space. Um, so, you know, we do a few things uh, other than, you know, we do the basics like networking amongst ourselves, talking about different opportunities, making sure that we share resources um, across the spectrum as some of us are still working clinically, some of us are working in academic spaces and, and administration. Some of us are working for government agencies like HRSA and CDC. Some of us are working in the public health space for public health departments or fairly qualified health centers. Um, so just kind of across the gamut. So we, we're very supportive in and of ourselves, but we also want to be a resource um, to others who are interested in health equity topics. And so our signature event has always, up until this year, because everything changed this year, uh, was our health equity symposium that we had annually in, um, in Boston. Uh, but we've also recently started podcasting um, in, in an effort to bring the health equity conversation um, home, if you will, to make it more of a conversational topic, to understand really what um, the challenges of health equity are, and to understand that health equity is not really based in health care, right? So it's all these other things. So we talk about the social determinants of health, right? All the things outside of the health care that you receive in the hospital or the clinic um, that really affect, you know, your long-term um, health outcomes. 
Okay. All right. So would you consider going back to um, Kenya or another country <laughs> for a few months? Um, so, you know, interestingly enough, I, I, I had the opportunity to go back to Kenya just to visit earlier this year before the pandemic happened. So that, that was nice just to go revisit the country. Um, as far as working abroad again, yes, I definitely want to go back. Um, I'd love to go back to Kenya. I, you know, I, I loved my experience there. I love the people there. Um, they were very welcoming and inviting and, um, and, and it was a total experience, like being there for so long, you know, I really got to know the people are, you know, if we would go to dinner, we would, you know, hang out. One of the other uh, doctors, we were friends. I went home to her with her to Burundi, which is a neighboring country. So I had, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I had a, a really robust experience there that I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, but the other side of it is I would love to go somewhere else as well. Right. So we, you know, we have this wanderlust, like we want to go to all the places. Um, so- so I would be excited about going to a different country um, and, and and seeing what the experience would be there as well. Okay. So usually in the beginning, I'm kind of switching my uh, uh, agenda around. Usually in the beginning, I ask people about um, where did your uh, passion for travel come from and when did you first get your passport? So, you know, I was thinking about that. I, I, I remember... Um, being in eighth grade and taking French because everybody had to take where I, where I went to school. Everybody took French in eighth grade, and so you had the opportunity to go to France at the end of the at the end of the year. Ooh. I did not, but people did, right? So <laughs> I remember thinking, "Oh, I wish I could do that," but I don't. You know, my family didn't have the resources to do that at the time. But I said, "One day, one day, I'm going to do that." And so my goal was that by the time I made it to college that I would have a, and it was, and I was thinking around language, like I wanted a foreign language experience in, you know, a native speaking country. Um, And my, I thought at the time, which is still, I think my thought that um, Spanish would be the best language to know as a second language. And so um, I saved literally every dollar, dime, anything anybody gave me from the time I graduated high school um, until senior year so that I could pay for this immersion experience. And so I, that's when I received my pay. It was all a part of this immersion experience for five weeks in Guadalajara, um, Mexico. Oh. And um, I, I did my passport. I uh, <laughs> told my family I was going out of the country and they were like, Okay. Um, and you know, <laughs> we, we piecemealed these dollars together. Um, my dad, thankfully at the time, was traveling for work and had frequent flyer miles that he didn't need. So he was able to help me with my plane ticket. Um, and it, it was really a village experience. Like, you know, I had family members slipping me five and ten dollars before I went. You know, <laughs> like, like, make sure you eat okay. Um, so it it was it was great. And I had a, a great experience while I was there. And so I think that kind of triggered the international um, process. And I didn't get to go again until many years later after um, after okay. um, I got. But to- you did get to go to France, right? I, I did go to France, but not until uh, a few years ago. Was that 2016, maybe 2017? Okay. I finally okay. made it to France, yeah. Yeah, because I took Fran- uh, French in for seven years between elementary and high school. And that was my um, exposure to um, a foreign language. And that made me want to just go to France immediately. We visited Qu- Quebec in my high school. Oh, yeah. It wasn't as great as but I wanted to see the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a few years to get there. I didn't get there until I was in my, I say, 40s. Yeah, but I got there. And I've been going every year except for COVID year. To see how I can sneak in there this year. <laughs> but great. So what would you, uh, some advice about um, looking into international studies or international travel, give me three tips you would give to anyone out there. Um, I mean, at first I, I would say, you know, figure out what is interesting to you and then, you know, plan where you want to go around that and, and make it happen. I think sometimes the limitation is, you know, I don't have a passport, right? you know, it does cost a little money. 
but you can plan for that and go ahead and, and go ahead and get the passport even before you know that you're getting before you go. Right. Because mm-hmm. um, you don't want to have that perfect opportunity. And now you're waiting for this passport in the mail. Right. So so go ahead and get your passport if you don't have one and, and just, you know, uh, plan that you're going to go somewhere. Um, don't let costs be a limiting factor. You can you can go a lot of places on a modest budget if you plan um, and if you're flexible. So I would say don't let cost be a, a, a rate limiting factor. And my third thing would be when you get there, um, try to stay long enough that you can actually immerse yourself in the culture, um, eat the local food, talk to the local people, um, go to, you know, you want to do the touristy stuff and go to all the tourist attractions so you can take your pictures and all that. But try safely um, to go off the beaten path sometimes and really see what that country has to offer um, and and try to understand the experience as much as you can through the eyes of the locals. And I, and I think that way you, you come my way with a more meaningful experience. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful ideas. So if we want to follow you and see your newest adventures, uh, where can we go to? So um, I blogged a lot about my uh, travels in Kenya on my blog, which is Nomad OBGYN. Um, That is also my Instagram page. So uh, I do most of my travel um, journey on those two platforms. Um, If you're interested more about health equity and Read Scholars, then Read Scholars has its own Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter page as well. Um, And then we have a YouTube channel, Read Scholars Live. Um, if you're interested, just in Mary Fleming, the OBGYN, um, she is on <laughs> LinkedIn and Facebook. So, and that's just my name, Mary E. Fleming, 1M, no S. <laughs> okay. Okay. Someone out there asked, uh, what's your favorite, uh, do you have a favorite locums company or do you just work for several different ones? Um, I feel like I need to get some uh, commission if I shout out people's names, but, um, <laughs> No, so the the company that I've worked, that's, I've worked for two companies. Um, one is one of the larger companies with a you know a, a bigger catchment and uh, you know long reputation. It's called Weatherby, um, and the, you know all, all companies have their pluses and minuses, but they've I've done well with them. The other one is a smaller company that's actually owned by two physicians, uh, Nia and Renee Darko. It's called Equal Access oh, Health. Oh yes. Um, so I really enjoyed working for uh, a smaller company, for working for people that I know, um, you know, that I felt like were part of the family and they took good care of me as well. So, Oh, we can give a shout out to them. Definitely. <laughs> yes. Actually, okay. yeah, me starting lives in my podcast, it was Dr. Nee Darko that got me going doing that. So yeah. shout yeah. out to Dr. Nee Darko and Dr. Renee Darko. They have a locums company physicians out there uh, and we'll put the name in the chat afterwards because I'll make sure I get the name right. Dig it up. Yeah, uh, like this help, but they are they are they are both phenomenal apart and together. So I, I recommend there you go. I'm going to give them a shout out right here right now. Yes, yeah. definitely. Oh, yay. Well, this was wonderful, Dr. Mary. I'm so glad you could join us and tell us about your experience in Kenya and Read Scholars. Uh, You said they had a podcast. What is their podcast? It's called Read Scholars Live. Oh, Read Scholars Live. Okay. Okay. Simple. I try to be as simple as possible. (laughs) well we'll have to check them out okay well thank you everyone for joining us i hope you enjoyed it and learned something and get out there and uh, if you don't have a passport get your passport just because and you can travel uh, on a modest budget uh, as long as you do some planning and always remember to immerse yourself in the culture wherever you go you can do tourists but get to learn Um, the real culture of wherever you travel. So once again, I am Yvette McQueen, MD. Uh, I help travelers to stay safe and healthy. And you can follow me on uh, any social media, Yvette McQueen, MD, and my website, Yvette McQueen, MD for now. So everyone stay safe, travel well, ciao for now.